What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And as always, we have ourselves a jam-packed show as we have a lot to get into in the world of volleyball, such as Mississippi State upsetting Florida. But it wasn't just that upset that happened. How about Arizona State upsetting, and not just upsetting, sweeping number five Oregon on Sunday? There were just upsets all over the place and just big time results, teams coming up big, including Miami, which swept Georgia Tech on the road. Just an impressive win overall for all those teams that pulled off upsets. And how about the Laguna Beach Open? The last tournament of the AVP did not disappoint, as it was a scorcher and a thriller. Also, the CIF Southern Section Division I Girls Volleyball Playoffs begin this week as eight teams are in pool play and will be facing one another for the chance to be facing each other for the CIF Southern Section Division I crown. Also, we have the Week 9 preview as what's going to be happening this week in Week 9 of the NCAA Women's Volleyball season. Hand me a volleyball. Set the net. Because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. Thank you all for joining me on this beautiful Monday afternoon, Monday evening, or Monday wherever you are listening from. Either way, you have made your way into episode 216 of Set Point. And without any further delay, let us begin. But first and foremost, Set Point would not be live without IE Sports Radio providing the platform to go live on Spreaker. Please do follow IE Sports Radio on what is formerly known as Twitter, X. TikTok, and on Instagram at IE Sports Radio. And we also have a Facebook page, if you still use Facebook. All you just have to do is type in the word IE, then sports, then radio in the search bar, then see our icon, like us, and then boom. That's how you're able to follow us. We also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com, which which is updated daily and has all the sports news our Hall of Fame, our blog site, our Fans of the Month, our pages dedicated to each podcast, such as Setpoint, our community forum, and our merchandise shop. Because for the past nine years and counting, IE Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. Thank you to everyone for all of your support and for making IE Sports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Also, a huge shout out to our sponsor, Planet Jerky Premium Brisket Beef Jerky. Planet Jerky is the official jerky of the 2022 California League champion, Lake Elsinore Storm, the single-A affiliate of the San Diego Padres. This all-brisket jerky has gluten-free options, contains no MSG, no sodium nitrate, it's low in sugar, and high in protein. This is some of the best jerky you can get your hands on, and all you have to do is visit www.planetjerky.net and place your order. Follow Planet Jerky on Instagram at Planet Jerky. Once again, huge shout-out to our sponsor, Planet Jerky Premium Brisket Beef Jerky, the jerky that's on a whole other planet. And you can follow me, Taryn Rodriguez, on X at Taryn Rodriguez one and on Instagram at Taryn Rodriguez 1992. But I don't really post on Instagram, but what I do post mostly on Instagram is on said the set point Instagram set point can be found on Instagram at set underscore point I E S R and on X at set underscore point I E. And with all that said and done, let us begin with the volleyball content as Patty Bax pops in the chat room. She says, have a great show, Taryn. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Patty. And Hopefully, I will be able to have myself a great show as we have a lot to cover in the span of less than two hours. And for me, I'm going to try to get this done as 
best as I can before my laptop craps out. So regardless, let us begin. So we had a lot happening in the NCAA women's volleyball world. So honestly, there were a lot of upsets and big time results. And this has to go back all the way to Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we had Indiana upsetting number 15, Purdue, 25, 23, 23, 25, 25, 16, and 25, 17. Avery Tatum and Candela Alonso Corncellus each had 12 kills. Morgan Geddes, 12 or 10 kills, while Alonso Corcellus also added 13 digs. And this is what I was talking about when it came to Indiana. I was preaching to the choir when I said Indiana is a very good team. They are a team that you do not want to overlook and they're much better than what that big 10 conference record says. And I saw them against Washington. I know they lost in three, but it was a gr- They put forth a lot of great effort and they had a lot of hustle and they served really tough for Purdue. They were led by Eva Hudson and Chloe Chicoin, who each had 17 kills while Raven Colvin added 13 kills. My takeaway for Purdue is this. They are a very unpredictable team. One week they're going to be pretty good, and then the next week they're going to be so off. But I kind of feel this is what a rivalry game kind of does to you. It brings out your highs and lows, and honestly, when it comes to this one, I kind of think they maybe overlooked Indiana a little bit, just because it's been a while since Indiana has beaten Purdue. I want to say it's been since 2012 since they last beat Purdue. Purdue, but it's it's been a while as that's that was a huge win for for the Hoosiers and honestly I really was impressed. I was not surprised, but I was very impressed. So a great win for Indiana because honestly they they needed a, a statement win and the two actually play again this Wednesday. So as of this recording, that's two more days from now. So I look forward to seeing what those who who Hoosiers can do. I really think they can definitely pull off another win, even though it's going to be at Purdue this time. So moving on from Wednesday, jumping over to Thursday, I talked about this matchup quite a bit, and this was an under-the-radar matchup. It wasn't a ranked-on-ranked matchup, but this was kind of an important matchup. This was LMU defeating San Diego in four sets, 23-25, 25-16, 25-22, and 25-18. LMU had a balanced attack. They had Michelle Schaefer with 12 kills, Jacqueline Moore, 11 kills, Kari Geisberger, 10 kills, and Amethyst Harper, 9 kills. Sam Hastings had 17 digs, which included a one-handed diving dig, which went over the net and eventually fell onto the San Diego side. It was a great highlight. Isabella Bearford also added 9 digs, and she had 5 service aces. LMU served really tough as they also outblocked San Diego nine and a half to seven. For San Diego, they were led by Kylie Priest, who had 13 kills, while Amber Stiverens only had 11 kills, as San Diego only hit 121. Now, my takeaway for this matchup is this: for the Toreros, they're simply not the same team as they were last year. San Diego is just not the San Diego team that made it to the Final Four, and This matchup showed it. And I tried to tell everybody that LMU always gives San Diego fits when they play at Gersten Pavilion, but no one wanted to believe me. So for LMU, this is another one of those cases where I'm not surprised that LMU won just because they do have some talent. Those players that I just mentioned, they are really good. And honestly, I would not be surprised if LMU found a way to win the West Coast Conference title. Staying on the West Coast and heading up north, we have UC Santa Barbara sweeping Cal Poly, 25-17, 25-19, and 25-20. Tasia Farmer led the Gauchos with 18 kills and out as the Gauchos outblocked their opponent 10 to 6, and they hit 340 while holding Cal Poly to 152. My takeaway from this matchup is this. Santa Barbara is very good as advertised. Meanwhile, for Cal Poly, they are a very up-and-down team. Like, it seems like they just can't stay consistent. They're kind of like Long Beach, except Long Beach has some sort of reasons why they keep they, fi- they find ways to lose. Except that wasn't the case this week. But for Cal Poly, their win streak ended at 5. I said that they were catching fire at the right time. And it was good. And Cal Poly, I think, can still make a deep run in the Big West Conference Tournament. However, I just feel that Cal Poly, as of late, they just don't have that consistent flow and rhythm to their game. They're either 
going five with teams that they shouldn't. Because remember, they had to go five with Long Beach State. They were up 6-1, and they wound up losing 15-13 in set five. And they also needed a reverse sweep to beat UC Irvine, which is not in the echelon of good teams in the Big West Conference, unfortunately. So for Cal Poly, playing on the road, this was kind of a mismatch right here. Now, this could be a whole different story. I, it could be a whole lot worse because if they were playing at Mott Gymnasium and they got swept, then I'd be singing a whole different tune about Santa Barbara being really good and Cal Poly just being blech. But honestly, I will say this about Cal Poly. They may need to find some consistency because – when it comes to playing Hawaii and Santa Barbara, those two look like the two-headed monster. Long Beach State kind of is peaking, but I don't know. Jumping over to Friday, which had a lot of big-time results, we had number 6 Louisville sweeping Pitt, 25-21, 25-23, and 25-22. Anna DeBeer led Louisville with 15 kills. Carl Kreese and Charity Looper each had 10 kills, while Ico Jones added 9 kills. As Louisville hit 388, Pitt was led by Tori Stafford, who had 10 kills, while Olivia Babcock had 9 kills. It's the first loss in ACC play for Pitt. My takeaway from this game is this. Louisville is still the Louisville as of old. and on or Not as of old, but as of this year and last year. And I think that NC State loss is proving that NC State is just as good as those teams that I just mentioned, as well as some of the previous teams. But I will just say this about Louisville. The demise of them was exaggerated and false. And I think Louisville is starting to get their bearings. And they got a little bit of help as number 11 Georgia Tech edged Florida State. 21-25, 25-23, 18-25, 25-18, and 16-14. A quick takeaway from from that matchup is this. Florida State did everything they could to try to beat Georgia Tech on the road, but it was just not enough as Georgia Tech just barely survived. But here's the thing about Florida State. If they were able to almost beat Georgia Tech on the road, they might, hence the word might, be able to make the NCAA tournament. Now, it means that they're prob- it's going to be a little iffy if they can make that tournament just because, well, for starters, they don't really have too many great wins, but that could change in conference play because who knows, maybe they could upset Pitt or maybe they could upset Louisville or something of that sort. Either way, they're in a Power 5 conference and that benefits them quite a bit. And if they finish top, let's say fourth, maybe third, then I- Florida State's a lock for the tournament. But Florida State did suffer its first ACC loss, which means there are no undefeated teams in ACC play. So I think the ACC is becoming a wild and crazy conference. Jumping down south and staying on course from Friday's matches, we had Mississippi State upsetting Florida, number 14 Florida for that matter, 25-18, 25-20, and 25-21. Might have mis- mistaken the set numbers, but either way, Mississippi State wound up winning in four sets. Amelia Shackelford led the Bulldogs with 18 kills, while Sophie Ag- Agee ha- added 16 kills. Carly Schmidt had 13 kills, while Lauren Myrick added 20 digs. While for Florida, they were led by Kennedy Martin and A.C. Fitzpatrick, who each had 18 and 17 kills respectfully but florida only hit 147 which is not going to get your your wins if you ask me but they did outdig mississippi state 61 to 45 which my takeaway from this matchup is this i don't know how florida is functioning with that this is kind of where you really miss alexis stuckey i just don't think they're the same team without her and it's sad because i think florida is a very solid team and if they could play their cards right, they could maybe become a threat. And they were the talk of the town before the Alexis Stuckey injury. But now it looks like they're, I don't want to say they're a thing of the past, but I just think they're not the same team. They're kind of like a broken mirror. Once it's broken, it loses its value. And Florida is just losing to teams that I don't think they should be losing to. I understand maybe the Texas A&M loss, but to Mississippi State? That's a little out there, if you ask me. 
And then Oregon State upset number 19, Arizona State, 20-25, 25-23, 25-18, 13-25, and 25-11. I'm going to keep this one short just because I'm going to talk about Arizona State a little bit later. I'm very surprised that Arizona State lost this one. Nothing against Oregon State, but Arizona State, I thought they were supposed to be better than that just because – I don't think Oregon State is on the level that Arizona State is, but it could be because Arizona State's non-conference schedule is biting them in the butt. However, this just goes to show the un the unpredictability of the Pac-12. I mean, also on Sunday we had Cal beating USC, which I was very surprised at, but also it could be because Cal is improved. So for Oregon State to upset Arizona State, it was a little bit baffling, but it kind of shows that the Pac-12, which is in its last year before everyone starts leaving for different conferences, it can be unpredictable, and it's any given weekend that a Pac-12 team can be upset. And then staying on course and jumping to the Big West on the West Coast, we had UC Santa Barbara edging out Hawaii 25-22, 19-25, 25-21, 21-25, and 15-13. This this was a cocktail of a matchup. I'm just going to say this right now. This was a doozy. So I'm just going to go to set five and... This set five, a lot happened. So the power went out during set five, and then eventually the replay monitor wasn't working, and Hawaii requested a challenge, but since the replay monitor wasn't working, they couldn't challenge. So Hawaii kept its challenge, but then five or six points later, the monitor was working. So I don't know, underst- I don't understand what happened. I wasn't at the match, but from what I was gathering, courtesy of Tiff Wells of Hawaii, the uh, play-by-play announcer for Hawaii volleyball on the radio. He kind of filled me in with his posts on Twitter. And honestly, how do you not, how do you have a monitor that doesn't work and then eventually works? That's just so convenient for Santa Barbara and so inconvenient for Hawaii. If I were a Hawaii coach, I'd be irate at the fact that I could not challenge anything. And the sad thing is, is that Santa Barbara actually, well, Hawaii tied it up at 14-14, and Santa Barbara challenged, and eventually it was seen that Hawaii touched the ball off of a Santa Barbara swing, and then Santa Barbara wound up winning set five, 15-13, and now Hawaii's two games back of UC Santa Barbara for first place. Which is tough, but that kind of wasn't what really lost them the game because they also got aced four times in set five. When And that's almost a quarter of the set. If you're getting aced four, maybe five times, then that team is serving really good or your serve receive needs to improve ASAP. But regardless, it was a great match. I just had to, ha- I just hate that it had to kind of boil down to that. And it's tough losing off of a overturned call. And... I will just say this. We got to have a better... There has to be a better system. I'm just saying. And I did pick Santa Barbara as my team of the week because I basically am holding true to my promise. If Santa Barbara were to go 2-0 and against Cal Poly and Hawaii, I'd pick them as team of the week. I didn't really... I saw upsets, but I also saw matches that were kind of followed up with not-so-good losses or matches before the hand that were followed up with not-so-good losses. With not so good loss, kind of like Arizona State and Tennessee, which I'm about to talk about in a little bit. So staying with the Big West Conference, we had Long Beach State sweeping UC Davis 25-10, 25-19, and 25-20. I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I wasn't at this match, but it was to the point in the first set where Long Beach State led 19-4. And I went to the the pre-week press conference with Tyler Hildebrand where he just speaks to the media and talks about last week and then goes into detail about this week. He said we were really prepared for UC Davis, and we prepared really well. And the reason why they lost to CSUN is because Savannah Chacon unfortunately had food poisoning, and she was unable to... She tried to hold it back in the first two sets, and eventually the food poisoning kind of caught up to her, and sadly she just couldn't continue. And she had nine digs, so it's not like she was playing bad, but... 
She just could not finish the rest of the match, which is unfortunate for Long Beach State because that CSUN loss could loom large. But I think that Long Beach State loss was more on the account that they needed Savannah Chacon more than anything. And not that I'm saying that Savannah Chacon was the reason why they lost. I mean, obviously they have other players that step up because they need to have that next player up mentality. But Savannah Chacon really passes well, and I want to say she's one of the best passers in the Big West Conference. And then the only matchup I have on Saturday, which staying in the Big West Conference, is Hawaii defeating Cal Poly 25-18, 22-25, 25-21, and 25-16. So set four, Cal Poly needed that set in order to force a fifth. They were up 14-13, but Hawaii closed the set off on a 12-2 run, which is unacceptable for Cal Poly. And this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Cal Poly is struggling against the big time teams and they also struggle to close against Long Beach State. Now here's my biggest concern for for Cal Poly. They lost to Hawaii at Mott Gymnasium and that's only the second time they've lost to Hawaii in Mott Gymnasium in the last six meetings. My fear for Cal Poly is this. If they can't beat Hawaii in Mott Gymnasium, I don't know how they're going to win in Stan Sheriff Center in Hawaii. I just feel that Cal Poly, yes, they'll probably get to the semifinals of the Big West Conference Tournament, barring any upsets, but I I don't know how they're going to beat Santa Barbara, and I don't know how they're going to beat Hawaii. They're going to have to hope that they're on, that up Long Beach State upsets Hawaii, and then they get the three seed and whatnot. But I don't even think that's going to work. So... And in addition, Cal Poly hit 88 for the match, which is unacceptable. You can't hit 88 against Hawaii. And Hawaii had like four different players with double-digit kills, I want to say. Either way, Cal Poly just lost to the better team on Saturday. Now we talk about Sunday, and this was where the upsets really happened. So the first upset we had was number 19... Arizona State sweeping number five Oregon at Matthew Knight Arena. So remember when I said that I don't think that Oregon State loss was too big of a deal? Well, sweeping Oregon at Oregon was a huge deal for Arizona State. And honestly, I was very impressed. I was, I was kind of flipping back and looking back and forth from the AVP match that I was at and looking down at the scores. And I'm like, really? Arizona State is actually winning against number five Oregon? Ooh. And honestly, Oregon did not play well. They Their only double-digit kill leader, and their kill leader altogether, was Mimi Collier, who had 11, 11, 12 kills. Oregon as a team hit 127, and they were out-aced 6-1. to one. And they were also out-blocked 10-6. to six. So for Arizona State, this was kind of a good redemption game. I only wish they did not lose to Oregon State. If so, I would have picked them as team of the week. But I had to go with Santa Barbara because I had to stay true to my word. Next up, we have going down south, number 23, Kentucky, sweeping Tennessee, 25-20, 25-23, and 27-25. I think, it was, I think set two was actually 26-24. I don't have the set score in front of me, which is unfortunate. But honestly, Tennessee, here's the thing. I don't think this is more of an upset. Yeah, and set two was 26-24. So here's the thing. I don't think this upset is as big of an upset as you think it is just because honestly Kentucky had the one player returning for them and that was Reagan Rutherford she had not played for four weeks the last time she played was against Nebraska which was on September 17th so it was almost a month since she last played in a match so for Kentucky getting her back it was huge but she didn't even put up that big of a numbers she only had eight kills and she hit 332 the big time numbers came from Brooklyn Delai, who had 13 kills. She hit 376. Then Azani Teeler and El- Elise Goatzinger each had 12 kills. As Teeler hit 526, while Goatzinger hit 632 with zero hitting errors. And they outblocked Tennessee 8 to 4, and they hit 356. So when you're hitting that high of a hitting percentage, and when you have a four-headed monster that's hitting above 300, and heck, Rutherford in her first game back wasn't even that bad. So yeah, everything just clicked perfectly for Kentucky. And this was a rivalry match. Like 
you rem- if you all remember, Kentucky got swept at- on its home floor against Tennessee. Tennessee, unfortunately, just had no answer for the four-headed monster from Kentucky. And this was two days after Tennessee beat Auburn in four, and number 22, Auburn in four. So number 10, Tennessee, kind of fell to Kentucky, which was not the biggest thing, but they did have their 11-match winning streak snapped. And my takeaway for Tennessee is this. You just got to brush yourself off because you're not too far back of the current leader, which is Arkansas, but you have Arkansas this week. And in addition to having Arkansas, which is currently in first place in the SEC, Kentucky is right on your coattails in terms of that SEC race. And if you don't play your cards right, Kentucky could actually revive themselves and win that conference. Because they only have one conference loss, which was to Tennessee, but they have to play Florida, which Florida is a mess right now with all of the injuries that they're sustaining, two of which are season injur- season-ending injuries for that matter. So for Tennessee, they got to brush themselves off, get themselves off the mat, and just get back at it. Otherwise, they're going to be at the mercy of everybody in the SEC. And then for Kentucky, I think they're back. It's a little early to say that, but I think they're back. And if they had another match and they had played on the road, I would have given Kentucky Team of the Week. But I will just say this. Kentucky, I think, is in good hands, especially with Regan Rutherford returning. She is kind of the heartbeat of that team. And with Regan Rutherford, Kentucky is a powerhouse. And they can hang with mostly anybody, as long as they're not beating themselves. Without Regan Rutherford, they aren't the same team, in my opinion. And then this is the true upset as we stay down south and head to the ACC. We had Miami upsetting number 11 Georgia Tech 25-23, 25-20, and 25-24. Grace Lopez had 22 kills and she had 306, while Flo Marie Hereda Colon had 12 kills. Grace Lopez having 22 kills in a three-set match is bonkers if you ask me. And Bianca Bertoloni had 13 kills while Tamara Oteen had 12 kills. Um, My takeaway for this matchup is this. I'm starting to think Georgia Tech is not the team that I think they are. are. I'm not saying Georgia Tech is bad, but I am going to say this. Georgia Tech is nowhere near on the level of Pitt, and they're certainly not on the level of Louisville. If they're having to go five with Florida State, which I admit, Florida State, I didn't think that they were actually good, but now they're good. And then... They're, they just got swept on their home floor against Miami. I just don't think Georgia Tech can thrive with the true big girls in the NCAA tournament. I mean, yes, they do have the win over Florida, and yes, they do have the win over Penn State. But I just don't think at this point they could thrive with a majority of these teams. I mean, they're well coached. I will just say that. But honestly, some of their players aren't as big time like Julia Bergman. Like, they're not Julia Bergman level. That's kind of all of my big time wins right there and notable wins right there. So other quick notables is that Texas beat Houston twice last week, which is no surprise. Nebraska swept Penn State on Saturday, which is also no surprise. I was no I would have put the I would have bet the farm on Nebraska beating Penn State as Nebraska is still undefeated and they're still number two in the nation. While Wisconsin swept their matchups, they even embarrassed Rutgers 25-4, which I want to say is like the second lowest, the second most widest point spread in a set in NCAA women's volleyball history. I want to say like the largest is like 25-3. I could be wrong, but I, I'd have to confirm that. But Wisconsin has yet to drop a set in Big Ten Conference play, as we are for sure going to get Wisconsin and Nebraska being on an undefeated collision course. Speaking of of undefeated teams, the Citadel is still undefeated as they edged Furman on Friday three to two, three sets to two, and then they swept ETSU on Saturday. So they had a little bit of a scare on Friday, but they were able to keep the undefeated streak as the Citadel, Nebraska, and Wisconsin are all undefeated. They're the only undefeated teams in NCAA Division I women's volleyball. All right, so that is that for the Week 8 recap. Jumping over to the ABCA and ABCA Division I women's volleyball coaches poll. So 25 through 21 consists of Nebraska, Western Kentucky at 25, UCF at 24, Auburn at 23, Houston at 22, and Baylor at 21. 
20 through 16 consists of Kentucky at 20, Purdue at 19, Arizona State and Florida tied for 17, and Dayton at 16. 15 through 11 consists of Creighton at 15, Kansas at 14, Georgia Tech at 13, Tennessee at 12, and Penn State at 11. 10 through 6 consists of Arkansas at 10, BYU at 9, Oregon at 8, Pitt at 7, and Texas at 6. 5 through 1 consists of Louisville at 5, Washington State at 4, Stanford at 3, Nebraska at 2, and your still number one team in the ABCA Division I Women's Volleyball Coaches Poll is... Wisconsin. So the top five still remains the same. Western Kentucky and UCF pop back into the top 25, and we finally get Minnesota out of there because they had to go five with Northwestern. They barely won. God. Minnesota, I hate to say it, but they're kind of a train wreck at the moment. And then Iowa State lost to Kansas State. I forgot to mention that matchup. That was a big win for Kansas State as this was back on Friday, I want to say. Either way, it's their second. It's Kansas State's second ranked win over a Big Twelve opponent, and yeah, it was it was actually on Wednesday, which Kansas State won 25-20, 25-16, 25-18. Aniah Clinton led the way with twelve kills. Aliyah Carter nine kills. Mackenzie Morris twenty one digs, and K State only missed three serves. While Iowa State was held to one ten hitting percentage, Maya Duckworth had twelve kills. Lily Wachols had ten kills. But back to the coaches poll. Yeah, Texas is climbing its way back into that top five. Not that I'm saying that they deserve to be in the top five, but they're getting close back into that top five. And Pitt, they're still number seven. They're still number seven, which is which is good. Oregon dropped a few spots. They dropped a couple spots. BYU, they actually had to go five with Texas Tech, which. Yeah, the Big 12 is a little underrated, if you ask me. I think the ACC is also a little underappreciated, just because they only have three teams in the coaches' pool, being Louisville, Pitt, and Georgia Tech. And then UCF, this is another team in the Big 12 that's kind of under the radar. They actually are undefeated in conference play, which, (laughs) if you told me that was going to happen, I'd still believe you, just because I think UCF is a little bit dis kind of got a little bit disrespected when it came to the coaches poll in the Big 12. And they were a very quiet 16-2. However, some of the something that's worth noting is that they play Baylor this weekend, and now this is going to really test them because they've got Baylor this week, TCU next week, Houston the following week, BYU the week after, Texas on November 18th, then Iowa State, and then Kansas to close off the conference schedule. So they've gotten through a majority of the winnable matches. Not, and I'm not going to call them the easy matches, but a majority of the matches that they're supposed to win. But now they got to go through the true gauntlet. And I'm not saying TCU is going is kind of a big time team, but they're kind of under the radar, especially since they beat Hawaii. I think it's a big win right there, even though it wasn't at Hawaii. Regardless, UCF is going to get really tested as. They're get, they're at Waco this weekend, so I'm interested. I'm interested to see what can happen with the with the with the uh, Golden Knights. So that's pretty much that for all of what happened in the NCAA Women's Volleyball World. We'll be jumping back to that in a little bit, but we do have some some uh, AVP to go over. As honestly. It was a, it was really fun, and <laughs> Mike Pat says, yes, I caught set point. How about those Knolls? Well, I hate to tell you this, but Florida State wound up losing, and I will say this. They did bounce back, but they're not undefeated in ACC play anymore. So, yes, those Knolls, unfortunately, are not undefeated, but hey, the, the, hey, some will come up tomorrow. So... Great to have you in the chat room, Mike. And jumping over to some AVP play. All right, this was kind of an interesting thing. So this was... The Laguna Beach Open was great and all. I just wish they didn't have the whole pool play thing. Because honestly, it just makes the whole tournament a lot longer. And some of the athletes were telling me were they like to keep us here as long longer than we need to be. So... Uh, I really like I really like bracket play instead of just pool play, just as a FYI for the near future. But anyway, so 
playing in the or watching this whole thing, this whole tournament was really awesome and all, and I, I enjoyed it. I just wish I could have gotten a little bit better. What's the word? Media treatment. But it is what it is, and it's a tour tournament. It's not like a Gold Series tournament, kind of like the Huntington Beach Open and all the other big time tournaments. So I can't really win them all, just like Mike Pat put in the chat room. And I will say this, unfortunately the AVP will not have the AVP championships as sadly, long story short, and this is from an outside source, I'm not going to really discuss who told this to me because I don't want this person to get in trouble, but this person told me that Bally Sports is no longer a part of the AVP and now that... uh, and that they didn't have like a television or broadcast provider. So I was very bummed out. So this Laguna Beach Open was the last thing. And the fact that the AVP didn't really put out a statement saying, oh, we're not going to have the Laguna Beach Championships. It's like, really? Dude, like, please, please, please just keep us in the loop. Because I didn't even know that the Laguna Beach Championships wasn't going to be happening until I saw it being taken down from their website. At least just put in a statement saying, we're sorry to disappoint everybody, but the Laguna Beach Championships is not happening this year. Uh, it's just tough. And I understand there's like like budgets, budgets happening, budget cuts happening, and like television providers at like being a thing and whatnot. But it's kind of the same thing that's happening with the NBA. Can't you just like put it on like a YouTube on your YouTube page and whatnot. So we'll see. Mike says, Oh dear, are politics and drama in, in infiltrating the AVP? I wouldn't say politics and drama, but they just need to have like consistency. And also when it comes to the Laguna open, not that I'm complaining about this too much, but there was no media workplace there. So it's another really moment. So I just got to say, Really? I because in on Championship Sunday I had to pick one spot on the stadium court and I had to sit there with all the fans, and I guess stand at, for that for the most part. And it was baking, and I was not dressed properly. I was in jeans, a polo shirt, an undershirt, and a sweatshirt. And well, not a sweatshirt, but a jacket. And long story short, I'm not going to abandon my jacket and take it off. Because if I take off my jacket and I abandon it, it's never going to come back. Because I'm most likely going to forget it because my brain is going to be fried. Anyway, so I wish they could have – the AVP could have provided a a little bit better of a like workplace so I don't have to like get deep fried like I'm a fried egg in a frying pan. But it is what it is. All right, but long story short, when it came to this tournament, it was a very fun tournament, and I enjoyed it. I I liked meeting most of the players. I liked meeting Lindsay Sparks, who attended one of my rival's high schools, and her story is really amazing. She actually had um, knee surgery to repair a damaged knee cartilage, and she couldn't play and she couldn't play volleyball, beach volleyball, for two years. And she's going to go back to get her master's, and she's going to be back to be playing collegiate volleyball, which is awesome. So I'm happy to have Lindsay Sparks back playing beach volleyball. And I told her this, and this is the big thing that I told her. Beach volleyball in the AVP is much better with you than without you because she definitely brings a lot to the table. And she was part of the – she was also kind of part of the COVID year, and she was part of the – Pre NCAA Beach Volleyball Championship UCLA team. So I'm not going to really recap everything that happened. I'm just going to go from semifinals all the way down, starting with the women's side. So we had Tegan Van Gunst and Kim Hildreth taking on Corin Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn. So it's Skirmerhorn, not Shermerhorn. And I and, and I told her that I'm like I'm sorry. And then the other semifinal was Brooke Bauer and Megan Rice. I only got to see the Brooke Bauer, Megan Rice semifinal. Oh, Brooke Bauer, Megan Rice taking on Gina Yurongo and Kelly Kalinske. Um, Long story short, I didn't want to leave my spot because if I left my spot, then that would have been the best spot on the stadium taken just because the AVP doesn't have a working place. So I basically had to be stuck at that one spot on the stadium court from now until the end of the day. Except I actually had to interview the champions, and then when I interviewed the women's champions, 
I saw that my spot was kind of taken, not fully taken, but I had to kind of squeeze on by in. So I had to make it work, and I'm that guy that is not going to make a fuss and like go crazy because someone took my spot. But anyway, so for the women's semifinal, I saw Brick Bauer, Megan Rice take on Gina Urongo and Kelly Kalinske. Rice and Bauer actually played a three-set match prior to this, and it was a barn burner, which they barely edged out Abby Van Winkle and Molly. They have her maiden name, Molly Turner, but it's actually Molly Shaw. She just recently got married, so now she's Molly Shaw, but Molly Turner Shaw. Molly Shaw Turner. So anyway, Abby Van Winkle and and, uh, Molly Turner were edged by... Megan Rice, Megan J. Rice for that matter, and Brooke Bauer. So there are two Megan Rices in this tournament. Megan J. Rice is the one that went to LMU and started out at UC Santa Barbara and played high school volleyball at Redondo Union High School in Redondo Beach. And going back to the semifinal between Gina Urongo and Kelly Kalinske, it was a thriller. It went to a third set, and and Urongo and Kalinske fought off six match points until Rice and Bauer was able to finish off the match with a, I think it was a roll shot tip kill. And that was a big win for Bauer and Rice, as honestly, Kalinske and Urongo are one of the more experienced pairs. And honestly, they've won tournaments in the past. So Bauer and Rice got the chance to face Corin Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn, which they swept their semifinal against Tegan Van Gunst and Kim Hildreth. So... The the final, the women's final between Quiggle and Quiggle and Shermer, Skirmerhorn, Quiggle and Skirmerhorn, and Rice and Bauer was another three set thriller. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how Rice and Bauer are surviving, having to go a third, go to a third three set match in 70 degree weather. And man, definitely do check out all the interviews that I had. I didn't want to interview the losing pair, which is unfortunate, just because I'm not about that life. But for the champion, it was Corin Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn. They're actually down 11-9 until they managed to put together a 6-1 run, and they wound up winning off of a hitting error from, from Rice and Bauer. So... This was actually the second meeting in terms of championship matches as Corin Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn met Brooke Bauer and Megan Rice in the Hermosa Beach Open Final, and they wound up beating the two in two sets, which Rice and Bauer were kind of the pair that, well, actually, yeah, it was Rice and Bauer that flew out of nowhere, though I think Megan Rice was partnered with Savvy Simo. So either way, Rice had some sort of familiarity with Quiggle and Skirmerhorn. And I did get confirmation that Corin Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn have the team name Quigglehorn. So I didn't unfortunately get a chance to – you all probably didn't get a chance to hear this on my interview with Corin Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn. But it's not a musical instrument that you'd hear from – you hear or see from a Dr. Seuss book. But – Corn Quiggle and Sarah Skirmerhorn were just flat out amazing. I want to say they actually wound up losing sometime in pool play, but that's kind of the beauty of this whole thing. You you can lose once in this tournament, but you can't lose twice. And pool play is kind of like the double elimination bracket, where you can lose once up until like the quarterfinals or championship Sunday, but after that, you're basically out so at that point so it it was all a little confusing and sadly i wish that we could have had a little bit more clarity but it's totally fine and yeah corn quiggle actually finished second in their pool behind abby van winkle and molly shaw so it just goes to show that you could lose once but you can't lose again and that's a very good thing just because you want to get your loss out of the way and you'd rather lose in pool play or in the single elimination bracket versus losing on championship Sunday, where if you lose on championship Sunday, you are out. No second chances. Bye-bye. So a great win for Quickle and Skirmerhorn. On the men's side, we had Sean Cook and Cody Caldwell defeating Caleb Quickle and Jake Urutia. And yes, the same Cody Caldwell that was on the Orange County Stunners. 
But on their way to the semi or on their way to the final, Sean Cook and Cody Caldwell took down Bill Kalinsky and DJ Klasnick. So D- Klasnick's first name is so tough to pronounce, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I am so horrible with first names. Like it, it, when it came to my interviews, I was so bad with remembering names because I normally have like a sheet in front of me, but I didn't have that sheet. Like, normally when I'm doing interviews, I at least have a box score. But when I'm doing AVP, I just have to start... I just have to remember to the best of my ability whose name is which. And then Caleb Quichel and Jake Urutia, Urutia upset Michael Grassell and Chase Frischman. And I don't know if we could use the word upset, just because this tournament had a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns. But in the end, Sean Cook and Cody Caldwell swept Caleb Quichel and Jake Urutia which was big time right there. And honestly, Caldwell and Cook were just having fun. Cook was basically being himself, and you have to see it to believe it because he was just having fun with the crowd and whatnot, and he was just... He was just a ball of electric energy. That's kind of all I have to say about him. And Caldwell was just strong and dominant as he's really transitioned well from the indoor game to the beach game. And I will just say this, those two are going to be quite the dynamic pair going forward. And, I, and I'm going to un- embarrassingly admit this, I did have a little mishap when it came to interviewing Sean Cook and Cody Caldwell. So Cody actually had to catch a flight, so I actually interviewed the two, two prior, and then I found out that the audio wasn't working because my mics had died. So thankfully, Sean Cook, I will give a sh- shout out to Sean Cook and a tip of the cap to Sean Cook for letting me interview him again. And I feel so bad and embarrassed for that because as a reporter, I got to be more prepared than that. I, I just have to learn to keep my my mics charged up. So there's that right there. And long story short, kids, make sure everything is charged up the night before. So all in all, it was a great tournament, and I'm glad I got to see lots of people that I knew, and I got to meet some new pl- some of the players. And even though it was a little bit tough uh, in terms of the weather and having to find a good spot, I enjoyed it. And a huge shout out to Rob Asparo for PA announcing the stadium court matchups. Normally it was Mark Schuerman that normally PA announces, but I guess he was unavailable, so Rob was back on the mic. And he was doing his thing. So a huge shout out to Rob Asparo. And this was the, I want to say it was the 68th annual Laguna Beach Open, which was a, which is the longest running tournament in California, which is awesome. Which means next week is going to be 69, the 69th year. Yes, it is the 69th annual Laguna Beach Open. So this year was the 68th annual, so next week is going to be the 69th annual. And I can't wait to possibly attend it, just because it's going to be fun times. And it's the longest running beach tournament since 1955, so I can't wait to see what the Laguna Beach Open can bring. But that is that for the AVP portion of the show, and that's that for the AVP season. There's no more tournaments, which is mind-boggling. It feels like yesterday since the AVP season just started. So I'll just say this. I'm hoping to go to more AVP tournaments just because I want to broaden my horizons more and actually learn who the people's names are and learn whose faces are who and actually have a media credential I just found it a little annoying just because there wasn't a workplace and I had to basically bake in the 77 degree sun yesterday. But I, I'm not the type of guy who would wear like jeans. I, I, I'm not who would wear shorts. I, like I'm more of a jeans and pants guy, if that makes any sense. But regardless, I enjoyed covering the AVP's tournaments, whether it was the Huntington Beach Open or the Laguna Beach Open. And I'm hoping I will be back doing some AVP next year. We're going to take ourselves a quick little commercial break. When we come back, we have the CIF Southern Section Girls Volleyball Division One playoffs to preview. And then we have Week 9 of the NCAA Women's Volleyball season to preview. Keep it locked here. You are listening to Set Point here on IA Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. Hello, sports fans. It's me, your boy, Larry B., and I want to walk you through the world of sports. 
No, no, no. Not just the mainstream major TV deal type sports, although those are important too. But let me be your guide for your journey of all sports, from college to the pros, the minors, and everything in between. Each week, we are talking sports galore with true diehards just like you from a hardcore fan's perspective that's sure to quench your thirst around leagues you may know all too well and some you may even discover here. That's right, sports fans. If you love sports of all kinds, enjoy hearing amazing sports stories and respect all sports because you know how difficult any of them can be to play or compete in, then this is your show. Join me, your boy Larry B, on the defining moment each week here on IE Sports Radio, your directly for all that is sports, and let the sports come to you. Hello, ladies and sinners. Hello, sports fans around the world. Hello, IE Sports family. This is Cal Henderson, the host of IE Vegas, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. If you folks are interested in sports in the Vegas area, if you're wanting to have a blast for one hour every Tuesday night from 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, this is a show built for the Vegas sports fans where we feature the Las Vegas Raiders, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Aces, and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada Rebels. Hopefully, fingers crossed, MLB team coming soon. Either way, if you folks are looking to have a blast for one hour each and every week, tune in Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you folks are interested in Vegas sports news, Go to our Twitter, at SinCities underscore I-E-S-R. And you can speak with me, the host, Kale Henderson, at Kale underscore Henderson on Twitter. At any time, be happy to reply. Always willing to reach out to our fans. Again, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi-Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kern, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks. Cubs, White Sox, we'll cover them all plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi-Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Welcome back to Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Shy Town Weekly will be coming up in about one hour and five minutes, but I will be back or I will be off before Adam goes on. As Mikey Two Guns pops in the chat room, he says, What up, my man? Hey, thank you for the updates on on Boston College. I glad I was able to help you out in terms of interviewing Jason Kennedy. 
And I'm glad you had a great time at Boston College versus Duke last Friday. So anyway, let's jump on into some high school girls volleyball as we'll probably spend the next like 30 or so minutes going over some high school girls volleyball and the uh, the NCAA Women's Volleyball Week 9 preview. So the CIF Southern Section Division 1 girls volleyball playoffs are here as the top eight has been selected. So the top eight has been selected into two pools. So it's going to be two pools of four teams, and the top two teams from each pool advance to the finals, and they'll be played at Cerritos College, Cerritos Community College. And then the two will be battling it out to see who is the CIF Southern Section Division One champion. Before we go on into that, Mikey says, Man, you are a huge help. Can't wait to get all the footage uploaded, which I will make sure to text that point in. Thanks, Mikey. All right, so your top eight CIF Southern Section girls volleyball teams are as follows. So in Pool A, we have Modern Day, Sierra Canyon, Marymount, and Palos Verdes. And then in Pool B, we have Miracosta, Huntington Beach, Alamany, and Los Alamitos. Everyone else that was in CIF Southern Section Division One and Two is dumped into Division Two, and they'll be battling it out for the Division Two crown. All right, so let's break down each of these teams one by one. So we'll start with Palos Verdes, as they were seated fourth in Pool A. All right, for Palos Verdes, here's my thing. Kendall Bashir is a beast. She has 456 kills, and she is one of the more highly recruited players out there. But it seems like she doesn't really have the the uh, backup that she needs, as Mally Labresh has 135 kills. She's also the setter, as she can play setter and opposite, and she's a junior. Talia Lindahl, who's only a freshman, outside hitter and opposite, she has 116 kills. And Daniela Rusic, she's a middle blocker, she has 115 kills. When I first saw Palos Verdes, my concern was, why are they not going middle? If they don't have a middle, then they are going to struggle. If Palos Verdes wants to be successful, they're going to have to really... They're, they're going to obviously need to get big numbers from Kendall Bashir, but they're also going to need to have other players step up. They're in probably the most toughest pool out there. I know two of their opponents are in their area, but Modern Day is on a whole other level. Sierra Canyon is the reigning champion, and Marymount is playing some darn good volleyball. Palos Verdes does hail from the Bay League, which was second in, which they finished second in, and that was huge because if they don't finish second in the Bay League, then they're probably not in Division One, and they're probably with, probably Redondo Union is in Division One because they were on the outside looking in. They were the first team out of Division One. So for Marymount, this is a team that has kind of caught fire ever since the Redondo Power Classic from a couple weekends ago, as. They finished second in that tournament. They beat Redondo Union, the tournament host, which they were ranked under at the time. And they also beat Los Alamitos, which they were also ranked under at the time. And those two wins and finishing in, finishing second in the Redondo Power Classic allowed them to jump from number nine all the way to number five. And they eventually finished at number five. And they wound up winning. And they wound up basically finishing second in their league. And they also finished fifth in the final CIF Southern Section Division One coaches polls. So Marymount has players such as Samantha Dessler, who's only a sophomore. She's an outside hitter and opposite. Kate Martin and Gabby Dessler are seniors, while Ellie Vandaway is a sophomore middle middle blocker. So for Marymount, here's my thing. I think they are a good team, and I think they're much better than earlier in the season. But my thing is do they have what it takes to beat Sierra Canyon? In league this year, they went 0 for 2, and we're not counting the forfeit win that Marymount earned over Sierra Canyon because that was kind of Sierra Canyon's decision, and that was in a tournament. So for Marymount, can they beat Sierra Canyon on the road in a best five, 3 out of 5 match? I want to say they can just because they do have some firepower, but I just don't see it happening anytime soon. But time will tell. I think Marymount has a good supporting cast. I really like their head coach, Carrie Klein. She has coached there for a long while and a half. And I will say this, I think you can't underestimate Marymount. I think if there's any dark horse team that you don't want to under that you don't want to overlook, it's Marymount. And then for their league rival, Sierra Canyon, Danica Rock, Madeline Way, Lola Brown, Sadie Isla Wale. Those are the players that are like 
the senior laden players that Sierra Canyon has. And now that Sierra Canyon is like Sierra Canyon has like a bunch of their eligible players or their players that are eligible, I think they're going to be in great shape. As Hannah McKinnis, she's second in kills on Sierra Canyon. Lauren Lynch is a phenomenal libero. And they have not lost the best three out of five match, and that is huge right there. So their only losses have come courtesy of tournaments. I mean, they should have won the Nike Tournament of Champions in Arizona, but things happen for a reason, and sadly, they just could not pull out the win in that tournament as they fell in the gold bracket round of 16. But it is what it is. So for Sierra Canyon, they're the reigning CIF Southern Section Division I champion. And my thing is this for Sierra Canyon. They're good, but are they on the level of modern day? I think they can challenge modern day, but they're going to need to have everyone step up. And it's going to have to be some high-level, high-octane volleyball that they play. Because if they don't, I just don't see how they make it back to the finals. Especially since modern day is senior-laden, which is perfect segue to go into modern day. Isabel Clark, bound for San Diego. I think, I, I, yeah, San, Isabel Clark is bound for San Diego. Samara Gordon is bound for Michigan. Those two are the kind of the two-headed monster. Laylee Ostavar is one of the more talented sophomores. She's an outside hitter. She's second on modern day in kills. Melissa Kawa, who's bound for Stanford. She has 414 digs. Tessa Hurley, even though she's a serving slash defensive specialist, she is second in digs with 258. She has 35 aces to lead the team. And then Lelio Stafar has 219 digs. Emma Kingston, a 6'5 middle blocker who's only a freshman. She has 82 blocks, and they have 93 kills, and they run a 6 And Modern Day runs a 6'2 offense. So I'm just going to say this. This could be the Modern Day's time to shine, but they just can't overlook anybody. Every team in their pool is really good. So if they think they're going to be getting a free pass to the finals, they have another thing coming. And then looking at Pool B, Los Alamitos. I want to say Los Alamitos can actually do something. Guys. And I think they're probably the biggest dark horse in the Division I playoffs. I think if there's any team that no one wants to play, it's Los Alamitos. Even, on the ro- even though Los Alamitos is on the road for, a majority of, for all of the playoffs, I think the Griffins have a great supporting cast, and they are well coached. And I'm not saying that just because... Their coach was a former guest on my show. But I will say that Los Alamitos, they have a lot of good serving power and firepower on their team. And those seniors do not want to go out losing. And they know who's in front of them. And they know that it's definitely going to be a climb to basically, you know, get to the finals. But the longer and the tougher the journey, the more sweeter the reward. And for Los Alamitos, I think they can... They can definitely pull off at least one upset. I think they're going to get at least one win just because Los Alamitos, I think losing to Marymount was more so Marymount catching fire than them just not being good. Jumping to Alamany. All right, I didn't get a whole lot of info on this team just because reasons. But I will say I'm very surprised at the season Alamany is having. They lost London Wajay, who was supposed to be a senior on their team, but she graduated early to enroll at USC, and now she's playing for the Lady of Troy, or the Women of Troy. And I will say, Alamany has really proved everybody wrong, and I'm very impressed by the Warriors. And I will say, I want to give them a good shot at maybe winning a couple but I feel Alamany is kind of that odd team out. I mean, last year they were in Division... What, were they in Division... I think they were in Division 4. And they wound up... It was either Division 3 or Division 4. And they wound up winning CIF. And this year, it's a whole different ball game for the Warriors. So there's no longer any more cupcake matches. Every match is a battle. So... We'll see what the Warriors can bring to the table. But I admit, them getting second place in their league was impressive, including beating Marymount. Their only problem is this. Since they beat Marymount in five the first time, and then Marymount beat them in four, Marymount has the tiebreaker over Alamany, and then Alamany is the third place team. Hence why Alamany is ranked below Marymount. Looking at Huntington Beach, I've seen Huntington Beach a lot, and they are very, 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 very good. Haley LaFontaine, Taylor Ponchek, and Addison Williams are a great 
three-player combo. And adding Kylie Leopard into the fold at middle blocker is absolutely amazing. Danny Sparks has done an outstanding job at the setter. And yes, Danny Sparks is the younger sister of Lindsay Sparks. And then Olivia Foy has taken the libero position and ran with it. My biggest concern is this. Can Huntington Beach stay consistent? Because last week they actually lost to Edison in five at home. And that was actually their first best of five loss. If they don't lose that match, they're actually the three seed. But I don't think their seed actually changed, honestly. I think they're still the three seed of this whole Division One tournament and honestly this is kind of the best case scenario they're still they're on Miracosta's path and their head coach Craig Pizzanti said that it's not tough to win at Miracosta but honestly Miracosta is a machine and that's perfect segue to go into uh, Miracosta when it comes to looking at them all right, Mira Costa, it's been a while since they've won a CIF Southern Section Championship. As they, It's been 2017 since they, or not 2017, 2007 since they last wound up winning a CIF Southern Section Championship, which was in Division One, and they wound up going undefeated. All right, so for Mira Costa, they, they have also have not lost the best three out of five match like Modern Day and Sierra Canyon as Charlie Furbringer, is kind of the lead leading lady. And then Audrey Flanagan has been blossoming as a sophomore outside hitter. Chloe Hines, Bryn Shackle, Taylor Deckert, who's the junior libero. They are just amazing as well. So all in all for Miracosta, they're a machine and they've got home court advantage throughout the entirety of the playoffs. My thing is this though, for Costa, can they, can they also remain consistent? And I will just say this, they have low Salmitos, in their first playoff match, I would be very careful with the Griffins. They know the Griffins know what Miracosta can bring to the table, and they played them in Hawaii in the Ann King tournament, but that was probably back then. And I'm pretty sure the Griffins are a much better team now. But you could also say the same for Miracosta, as honestly for Miracosta, they didn't have Charlie Furbringer at setter because she was with the U.S. Junior National Team, so. For Miracosta, they just they just can't underestimate anybody as well because they have not seen Huntington Beach and they don't know what to expect from Alamany. But I will say next Tuesday I plan to attend the Huntington Beach and Los Alamitos matchup, barring anything getting in the way. So I will say this about Miracosta. They are definitely primed to win the CIF Southern Section Championship, but they just can't overlook anybody which they've done a great job of doing so, even though they had to go five with Palos Verdes and five with Redondo Union in the league. But if I had to pick who, who who's going to be advancing to the finals, look, it's so tough to really pick a clear-cut winner, but I got to go with the simple and uh, the safe pick, Modern Day and Miracosta. I think Modern Day and Miracosta are on a crash course to face one another, and it would be... It would only be fitting to have the Monarchs and the Mustangs face one another. I'm not trying to discount that Huntington Beach can't win because I think they're just as good as of a team to beat Costa. And I would not be surprised if they won at Miracosta, but Costa is just a serving machine and they just put a lot of pressure on you. And then Sierra Canyon, they have their full team. They're playing some darn good volleyball. And Los Salamios, you just can't discredit them. And I'm not discrediting anybody. I think anybody can beat anybody, but I just think Modern Day and Miracosta are a cut above the rest. All right, but that's going to do it for the high school volleyball girl, high school girls volleyball talk right there. Mikey Two Gun says, I forgot to mention how the Boston College coach made a point to say how awesome that you are to helping expand the game to the East Coast because he mentioned that the challenge it's been to bring recruits from the West Coast out here. He also says, also on a personal note, thank you for your dedication and patience to to educating newbies like me to the game. Also, great suggestion for recommending Duke for the Duke game, for the Duke game to go to a thrilling five set match. And nay, no problem, Mikey. I'm glad to help you out. Mikey Two Guns is the host of our Boston Show on I Sports Radio. Catch him every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern. He does a great job with his show. All right, but now let's get on into the NCAA Women's Volleyball recap or preview of Week 9. As I'm going to try to go through this as fast as possible because um, I'm going to say this 
embarrassingly, I'm actually doing my show on the road in a in a different location, and I don't have my laptop charger, so I ha- only have a few minutes until I until my computer goes kaput. Anyway, so matchups to watch for. Starting off on Wednesday, we have Indiana Purdue round two. So Indiana was able to win on its home floor against Purdue. Awesome. Now you got to go on the road and beat the Boilermakers on their in their gym. I really want to give the Hoosiers a shot, and I think they can definitely do it. But Purdue is going to be mad as heck because they really want revenge for what happened against Indiana. And this just goes to show that Indiana is a darn good team. You cannot overlook anybody. And Indiana is just so good. Like, they they serve tough. They have great... They have a great offense, and they play some darn good defense, and they're scrappy as heck. So Indiana is amazing. And for Purdue, they just can't oh, – they now know what to expect from the hoo-hoo Hoosiers. You just cannot underestimate them. Otherwise, they're as good as sunk. Also on jumping to Thursday, we have a little under-the-radar matchup right here, Iowa State versus BYU. All right, for Iowa State, here's my thing. It's going to be tough to win this matchup. If Iowa State can beat BYU at BYU, they deserve to be ranked again. But it seems like Iowa State just cannot stay consistent when it comes to re when it comes to you know winning against teams that they should be beating and staying ranked. I'm sure Iowa State's going to make the NCAA tournament, but I will say. If they want to have a better seed, I think you got to beat some of the big girl teams out there. Beating BYU would be a start, especially at Smith Fieldhouse. And then also on Friday, we we have – oh, I should, I should also mention that Iowa State-BYU is also going to be played on Friday. But now jumping over to Friday's matchups, we have Arkansas, which is number 10, taking on Tennessee, which is number 13. Number 12, they actually have the rankings flipped on the NCAA women's site, which that needs to be updated. Hint, hint, NCAA. Anyway, um, so Arkansas is your only undefeated team remaining in the SEC. Now they get the big test of going to Knoxville to take on Tennessee. Here's my thing for Tennessee. I don't think they're a bad team. I just think that they ran into the Kentucky team, which saw the return of Regan Rutherford, which she did pretty good for her first game back. And that offense was just clicking as heck. If Tennessee wants to win, they're going to need to have consistent offense and defense. And they're also going to need to put some pressure on the serving line. I feel if Arkansas wants to prove themselves, this is the match they have to do so. I don't really know what else to say to that match, except I think maybe, maybe we could see Arkansas undefeated, but don't count out Tennessee. I think Tennessee is just as good of a team as Arkansas. I think those two are basically on the same level, so I'd be very I would not be surprised to see either that match going five. And a sneaky good matchup would be number eight Pitt at NC State. So NC State really wants to prove itself. Well, you beat Louisville, now you gotta beat Pitt, which well, I will say this for Pitt, you're you're at least in first place in the ACC, but you kind of have some company. You've got Florida State, and now you've got Louisville. So you really can't afford to foul up. But NC State is pretty darn good, and they are there's, – they're very – they're very solid. And the, the thing that I'm concerned about is can Pitt win at home? So we'll see what happens with – NC State and Pitt, but honestly, I really would keep an eye on that matchup. I think Pitt is going to not have an easy matchup when it comes to them, and don't be surprised if that one goes the distance. And then I will also, I, I think there's not going to be any noteworthy, notable uh, Big West Conference matchups to all you Big West Conference heads out there. But the big time matchup we have this weekend is Nebraska hosting Wisconsin, number one, Wisconsin heading down to number two, Nebraska. And remember how I said we're getting that matchup, that undefeated matchup? Well, we are. But we have to wait because Ohio State plays Wisconsin in Madison while Nebraska heads down to Illinois to take on Northwestern. So barring any big upsets, we're going to get number one versus number two, undefeateds, 
that should be played on national television. What the heck, NCAA Women's Volleyball? What the heck, ESPN? Why must you do this to me? Anyway, so for Wisconsin-Nebraska, oh man, this is the matchup right here. And honestly, this deserves national television. This deserves to be on NBC, except we're going to get freaking Michigan and Michigan State. No offense to Michigan and Michigan State fans out there. But honestly, Mikey Two Guns asked the, the biggest question. Who's my pick for that game? Well, all right. That's a very good question, Mikey, and I'm just going to say this. Uh, Wisconsin has not lost a set, but Nebraska, I think, has the schedule. Wisconsin fans, forgive me for this. I'm picking Nebraska. <laughs> if for some reason Wisconsin pulls out the win, I will gladly eat my crow. And I pray to God I don't get put on blast. And this is the one time I kind of hope my I, I don't want anyone, you know, listening. Except I do. But I've got Nebraska winning. I think this is the time where Nebraska has to come out on top. And I know they've had a few close calls, and I know they had a little blips on the radar in terms of losing sets, but that is what the beauty of it. That's the thing about Nebraska. They're getting all the bad sets and all the slip-ups out of the way. For, them, for when they play Wisconsin, they do not have that sort of thing. For that sort of thing. And the reason why I don't think this is nationally televised is because Probably because of college football, and college football is king because cha-ching, cha-ching. That sounded weird. Anyway, so jumping to the Big 12, we have UCF Baylor, number 24 UCF, taking on number 21 Baylor. All right, UCF, you want to prove yourself? This is the time, as UCF, they are undefeated in conference play, as they're a very quiet uh, 16-2, and and they are undefeated in conference, but... You gotta look at their conference wins who they've beaten. They've beaten Cincinnati twice, they've beaten Oklahoma, beaten Oklahoma twice, they beat Texas Tech, and then they beat West Virginia, and then they also beat Kansas State. So I will say this about UCF, you're gonna have to really get your you know what together and buckle down against what Baylor, because playing at Waco is so big time. And it's not like playing in Orlando, Florida. So buckle up for that matchup, UCF fans, because it is going to be a wild ride. So those are some notable Saturday matchups. Then on Sunday, oh boy. this. So if I, I actually didn't get a chance to really write down these matchups just because I was in a rush, but... Nebraska and Wisconsin are kind of my co-matches of the week. Because the other one for this Sunday is number three, Stanford, taking on number five, Oregon. And that actually is flexed into ESPN. It's actually getting flexed into primetime. It's actually got a time change. So instead of being at noon Pacific time, it's going to be on at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. So it's going to be playing on Sunday Night Football. But I am for sure going to be watching... Stanford, Oregon over Sunday Night Football. And I'm sorry, but it is the truth. But this is number three Stanford taking on number eight Oregon. Yeah, NCAA websites kind of got to like update it. I know it's just the first day ever since every all the rankings just appeared, but come on. All right, so for Stanford, Oregon, all right. If Oregon really wants to prove itself and if they really want to prove that that Arizona State loss was nothing more than a fluke, they got to really buckle down and take down Stanford. Because if they don't, then they're going to fall further and further back of the Big 12 uh, – or, or not Big 12, Pac-12 conference. So here's my thing for, uh, for Stanford, though. They're playing some darn good volleyball and – they did get that big test out of the way where they beat Washington State in four. Now I'd really like to see them put themselves to the test and take down another really good opponent on the road. If they can beat Oregon on the road, then they are for sure legit. And I really got to give – I don't have I given them team of the week? I don't think I have. Regardless, I think this would be a statement win if Stanford were to beat Oregon at Oregon. Then also on Sunday, we have number 10, Arkansas, taking on number 20, Kentucky, on at Kentucky. 
This is going to be a fun one right here. Arkansas gets to prove itself round two. This time against Kentucky. It's true, the true big sister. This is kind of the true passing of the torch. If Arkansas really wants to show us all that they are the true class of the SEC, this is the week to do so. You got to beat Tennessee. You got to beat Kentucky. And here's the thing for Kentucky. Now that they have Reg and Rutherford back, there is no more excuses. You can't say, oh, we weren't at full strength. No, you have your star player back. You have other players playing at a high level. You got to actually show up. Show up or get shown up right here and now. So for Kentucky, I would not be surprised if they won. So for Arkansas, I think the pressure is kind of on them because they're going on the road, not once, but twice against two top 15 opponents. So I'm really excited for that matchup. And then also on Sunday, we have Purdue taking on Penn State, number 11 Penn State, hosting number 19 Purdue. All right, this is a busy week for Purdue. And for Penn State, I will say this about the Nittany Lions. That loss to Nebraska does not define them. Now, what could define them is if they lose to Purdue and if they have any other bad losses. So I will say this about Penn State. They're uh, they're still a very good team, but they just can't afford to fall a bunch of times. They just can't afford to slip up every here and then because – they can get away with one loss here and now, but if they keep the, these losses up, then I just don't – I can't be overly sold on Penn State. And then for Purdue, I'm really getting sick and tired of seeing this up-and-down scenario. I think Purdue is a good team. Eva Hudson and Chloe Chacoin are a great one-two punch. But honestly, you just can't st- – and oh, well, no, no, we also can't forget about Raven Colvin popping out here and there. But – you just can't be inconsistent in the Big Ten. And you also can't be inconsistent in the NCAA tournament. Otherwise, you are going to get ousted easily. I, I also forgot to mention UCF and Baylor are playing on Saturday and Sunday. So buckle up for for a doubleheader right there. And I don't think there's any other... There's too many matchups to go over. Except we have a under the radar matchup this week. We actually have two under the radar matchups in the West Coast Conference as Pepperdine. They've got a big week ahead of them as they hit the road for the round two of the PCH Cup to take on Loyola Marymount on Thursday. And then after that, they play San Diego on Saturday at the Jenny Craig Pavilion, which is big time right there. As you remember, Loyola Marymount knocked off San Diego, which San Diego is no longer in first place, meaning Pepperdine is the only team that is in first place in the West Coast Conference. So Pepperdine has a huge week ahead of them, and they have to come up big as they have to travel on the road. So although there's no big West Conference matchups to watch for, we have the West Coast Conference as Pepperdine is going to get its money's worth this week, and they really need to come up big. And they, the West Coast Conference is kind of in their hands. I think they do have a solid team. I just think they got off to such a slow start having lost to the likes of Kansas, Texas A&M, and UC Santa Barbara. Kansas being ranked, Santa Barbara receiving votes, and Texas A&M owning an upset win over Florida and playing in the SEC. So I think for Pepperdine, this is a huge week for them. And now I think that's going to do it for all of the matchups to watch for in week number nine of the NCAA women's volleyball season or an NCAA volleyball week. But before I head on out of here, I do have to give a shout out to Sarah Hughes and Kelly Ching as they wound up winning the FIVB World Championship as they knocked off Duda Lisboa and Anna Patricia Ramos of Brazil in the championship match. 21-16 and 24-22 as they became the first U.S. pair to win since April Ross and Jen Kessie did it back in 2009. And they're only the third pair to do it as Misty May, Trainer and Carrie Walsh Jennings did it back in 2003, 2005, and 2007. So a great accomplishment there for Sarah Hughes and Kelly Chang as they wound up coming up big in that tournament as beating the... And by the way, Duda and Anna Patricia were actually the number one pairs in the nation 
hailing from Brazil, and they, they are not an easy pair to defeat. So the fact that Sarah Hughes and Kelly Chang beat them was absolutely dynamite. And then also I have to give a shout-out to Chris Nuss and Taryn Cloth as they actually took third place in that exact same tournament as they fell to Sarah Hughes and Kelly Chang in the semifinals, which is unfortunate just because USA pair versus USA pair. But to their credit, they played them tough to the best of their ability, and they eventually found wound up getting third as they actually defeated a pretty good pair from Australia as they defeated Talika Clancy and Maria Faye Artachu. If I mispronounced those, I apologize. They beat them 15-21, 21-19, and 15-8 to claim the bronze medal of the FIVB Beach Volleyball World Championships. So congratulations to those two USA pairs on getting some hardware. But it was a huge accomplishment for Sarah Hughes and Kelly Chang to get gold, as that is a big-time accomplishment there, winning in the FIVB Beach Volleyball World Championship. As that's actually their first world title. And like I said, it's, they're the third USA pair to win that whole tournament. So big ups to Sarah Hughes and Kelly Chang. And that is going to do it for that Beach Volleyball shout-out right there. And ladies and gentlemen, that is going to do it for this week's episode of Set Point. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time to drop the beat, because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Set Point. I really do appreciate everybody tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I appreciate you. Shout out to the chat room, Patty Bax, Mikey Two Guns, and Mike Pat for tuning in. I really do appreciate you listening live. And I really appreciate everybody tuning in and bearing with me through all that has happened. I should be back on my normal time next week. I promise you. There shouldn't be any more hiccups, if any. And if anything, I'll just let you all know on X, which you can follow me on setpoint, at set underscore point IE. And then on Instagram, you can follow me there, at set underscore point IESR. For everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Sarah Rodriguez signing off. Have yourself a great rest of the week. I will see you all on Thursday a little late, but I will be at Long Beach State at UC Irvine. And then Saturday, I'll be at Long Beach State for Cal State Fullerton at Long Beach State. Have a great rest of the week, everybody. Enjoy the volleyball action, and I will see you Thursday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Peace!